Welcome to Molecular and Cellular Biology. I'm Mark Ainsworth, and we are going to just talk a little bit about biology in a very general sense um, in this first recording. So biology is quite a broad topic. It is the study of life. And if you break down that word, bio and logi, um, we have life, and discourse or treatise is logi. Um, study of. You can think of it that way. So the study of life. It's a tremendously broad topic. Um, when you look at biology with relation to the other sciences, um, I like to envision a pyramid like this. Um, it's not a judgment call. It doesn't say biology is better than the other sciences, but it does say very clearly that biology is dependent on the other sciences. Where mathematics at the base of this pyramid can stand alone, isolated. You can study math and study nothing else. Um, but if you want to study physics, you have to do that on the backs of mathematicians. You need the tools that math provides to study our world and create the laws or um, describe the laws um, that govern our world. That's physics. Chemistry is the same way. The relationship of chemistry to physics and math is it depends on the, phys the physics of our world to understand how matter interacts um, with other matter. Um, but you can study chemistry or physics and never study um, anything above you on the pyramid, which leaves biology at the top. So to do biology well, you have to understand chemistry, you have to understand physics, you have to understand math. Because ultimately, and I'll say this a lot, is it's all it's all physics, right? Like there's nothing special, there's nothing magical about biologi bio biological life. Um, it follows the same rules as everything else. So you have to understand those rules um, to do biology well. So do keep that in mind. It is the most challenging of all the sciences um, to do well, in my opinion. Now, what you're going to see as you study any of the sciences more and more is that there is a great interdependence. Um, when I worked in industry, you know, I sat on a team with polymer chemists and organic chemists and molecular biologists and cell biologists and electrophysiologists. And it was only by each of us bringing our individual expertise could we accomplish anything. And that really is the trend. So you want to be as familiar as you can with everything that you can. Um, and with biology, it lends itself to that because you have to. Right? So there's this overlap and this interdependence of these bodies of knowledge that traditionally were more siloed, but we're definitely moving away from that. Um, and we'll talk about that more as the quarter progresses. Now one thing to think about when we talk about integration of different um, disciplines is really a systems approach. But to understand a systems approach, we need to contrast it with what's called a reductionist approach. This is an approach to understanding something. And I was trained in a very reductionist approach system. So I worked for a biophysicist um, in my graduate work, and we broke things down. We reduced complex systems into simpler components to try to understand them. So we looked at photosynthesis, specifically the mechanism, the machinery that pulled proteins across the thylakoid membrane, which is the green photosynthetic membrane in plants, so that the pieces of the photosynthetic machinery could assemble. But it was all about breaking it down. And that's not a bad approach. It can be incredibly fruitful. Um, think about if you wanted to understand how a car worked. Uh, you could take it apart. And as you took it apart, you could break down each individual piece and hopefully gain deeper insight into how it worked and put it all back together. Now, you could do that and know a car inside and out, but until you drive a car and practice driving a car, you don't become a better driver, right? So it's the gestalt, um, the synergy of the system that we think about when we talk about systems approach. It's a holistic understanding, especially in biological systems. The beauty when you look at the system is that you see more than the component parts. When you organize things, in a system or in a cell, for example, you see things that we call emergent properties. And we're going to see that as we look at a biological hierarchy. Right? So if you look at levels of biology, so a hierarchy is you've taken things and you've placed them into um, an organization where certain things are above, below, or on the same level as other things. So if we look at biology, we study everything from down, down from an atomic level all the way up through ecosystems. And so when you look at this, this is basically an outline of what you're going to cover in the intro series of molecular and cellular 
you know, competitive animal, animal physiology, and then on to um, plant physiology and ecology. So here we're going to start with atoms and look at atoms and how do atoms come together to form molecules and how molecules come together to form cells and cells come together to form tissues and so on and so forth. But what we see is that life emerges from that organization. Life itself is an emergent property. Right? So as we bring certain molecules, the right molecules together, and organize them in just the right way, we get a cell. And that cell is something that we consider that's alive. So this idea of the emergent property is really, really important with biology. And um, we're going to define that now as properties that are the results of component parts together in a system. Right? Examples of sodium chloride. Those two elements alone do not um, have the same characteristics as table salt. Right? A photosynthesizing leaf can take solar energy and convert it into biological energy. But I can't take all the lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids that compose that leaf and just mix them up in a soup and say, go. It has to be organized. But when I organize them correctly, I do get this living thing, an emergent property. A neural network is more than just a dish of neurons. They have to interact with each other. They have to connect. They have to organize. And then we have something that, quote, unquote, um, can process information. Right? So this biological hierarchy is very important. And like I said, we're going we're gonna to touch on kind of the first third of that um, as we move through this particular uh, segment of the intro series on cellular and molecular biology. Now, as we talk about this particular emergent property that we call life, um, we see that there are certain characteristics that are associated with all things that we consider alive. And so I want this list to be something that you have in mind as you move through, um, especially its molecular and cellular biology, because we're going to be spending a lot of time on things that you cannot see um, and reactions that some consider will be like, well, that's a living reaction. Well, the, the word living then becomes a little more ambiguous. So we want to talk about things that are alive that show some degree of order, right? That they have some mechanism to regulate you know, that order and maintain it. And that's certainly going to take energy. So they have to process energy. So every living thing that we know processes energy in one way or another. And everything that we know that lives also grows and develops. Even from the simplest of organisms, from single cells, they grow and develop and then reproduce. So everything that's alive on a species level really has a means, a mechanism to reproduce, um, to be considered a type of life. Um, anything that's alive has to be able to respond to its environment. Right? If it can't respond to its environment, then it won't be alive for very long. And then finally, there's an inherent variability to life built into the system. And we will talk about that more in much greater detail this quarter. But that then is the linchpin for evolution. That variability allows all living things to evolve. And everything that we've seen that's alive has some variability as it reproduces that leads then to evolution. Selection of the most appropriate for any given environment. Now, when you talk about commonalities, you can also get more specific, and we will do this as we progress through the quarter. Um, all life also is cell-based. So this is the introduction of what we call the cell theory. So everything that's alive has at least one cell. Right? So we haven't been able to see anything that fits all these criteria that um, isn't at least one cell. And the very interesting note is that all cells have DNA. Right? There is not a living thing that we've encountered that doesn't have DNA, that follows basically the same rules for every living thing at the center of its cell. And so these are things, these are big themes, big themes, broad strokes, that I want you to keep in mind as we progress through the quarter, and even back, in fact, through the entire year of intro biology.